Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Rachel Swarn's journalism career has taken her all over the world, to Haiti, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, Russia, South Africa, where she was the Johannesburg bureau chief for the New York Times, and back to the White House. She's the author of American Tapestry, the story of black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, which was published in 2012. But now, it's her weekly New York Times column that seems to have won her heart. The working life is about New Yorkers and how we are coping in our work and in the changing economy. Welcome. Thanks for having me. As I said, you travel all over the world for the, for the Times and for other papers. Is there a single overseas assignment that you covered that affected you more than the others? Oh, that's a hard question. Well, you know, I, I really, I mean, I love them all. I think um, I got into journalism um, thinking I wanted to work in Latin America. Um, so the work I did in Haiti and in Cuba um, had, you know, some particular resonance with me. Um, but at the times, you know, they throw uh, curveballs at you, and South Africa was one of them, and it was a really remarkable time. Um, and, um, you know, I covered about 10 or 11 countries. Um, from there. From there, um, in the southern part of the continent. And it was, you know, it was a remarkable experience. Now, I'm sure that we all remember the excitement that attended Mel Nance, Nelson Mandela's release from prison. Um, the collapse of apartheid. Um, and while the country faced, as you know, huge challenges after the end of apartheid, there was so much optimism about what, was, what the uh, New South Africa was going to be like. Um, I'm wondering if you follow, if you followed what's been going over there since you left, um, and what your sense is of how the country is doing now under President Zuma. You know, I, I arrived in 99 and, um, you know, at the time, and, and still, you know, the business was about, uh, was less about kind of, you know, the end, the dramatic, the end of apartheid, um, the arrival of, you know, black majority rule, um, democracy. It was more about, you know, uh, trying to bridge um, the divide, um, you know, trying to, um, bring services to uh, black people who had been um, denied uh, basic things, bring water, electricity, housing, education, um, and, and also, you know, trying to bring a country together. And I think that um, those things are, that's hard work, and it remains hard work. Um, our own history tells us something about how long that kind of work can right. take. Um, I know that for a while there seemed to be quite a few African Americans who were moving to South Africa. I guess they wanted to be a part of the, the, the excitement, the new South Africa to help out and somebody to make money there. Uh, is that still happening? Or do you have, get a sense of that? You know, I'm not sure. When I was there, certainly there, there were a number of people who had moved, you know, again, with that excitement, thinking um, about to the, the opportunities, business opportunities there. Um, and uh, people were received, um, you know, people there, South Africans had some mixed feelings um, about uh, the African Americans who arrived. Oh. I remember an article in the Times in which uh, some black South Africans said, you know, who are they coming over here trying to tell us what to do? Right, and, <laughs> and sometimes, sadly, I think, uh, as Americans, people, uh, some people, not everyone, because some people went and, and really connected and, and, and did, you know, really and probably continue to do great work. But some of the, um, the attitudes of, you know, we're here to show you, I think, rub people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So um, you came back. Did you go directly to the White House? No. So I came back in 2003 uh, to Washington and did a number of things. I covered immigration uh, for a while uh, during a period when um, there were efforts, as there are, still are, uh, to uh, pass legislation um, to legalize um, undocumented people, and there were massive protests around the country. Um, I started um, covering uh, 
the White House and in particular covering uh, Michelle Obama after that election mm -hmm. in 2008. Okay. And you wrote um, this book about her ancestors. What motivated you to do that and did you find out anything that just surprised you? I um, was, you know, covering her first year in the White House and one of my colleagues uh, right before that first inauguration was writing an article about the president and his rainbow family and we realized then that we didn't know very much about Mrs. Obama's uh, family and so uh, she asked a genealogist to do uh, some work but um, as things often are in journalism we didn't give her enough time and she didn't come up with much and the story ended up being mostly about the president and his family but um, the genealogist got hooked and she kept digging and digging and in September of that first year that the Obamas were in the White House she called us back and said you know I think I found some really interested stu interesting stuff. Would you be interested in working on this? And we were. And really, it was um, the story that ran was about the First Lady's great, great, great grandmother, who was a slave girl named Melvinia, who was valued at about $475 in the 1850s. And uh, Mrs. Obama's great, great, great grandfather, who was a white man whose identity was a mystery. And so um, it ran in the New York Times in October um, of that first year. They were in the White House and a publisher approached me and said, would you be interested in doing more? And what I was able to do during the course of the two years that I spent researching was identify uh, through DNA testing um, the white ancestors in her family tree. Mm -hmm. And of course, many of us African Americans know that we have them somewhere um, but to be able to kind of actually say these are the folks and this was these were the circumstances though there are many things that we don't know right was interesting was he a slave on a type what was he yes so it was kind of the most ordinary of stories right so um, it was uh, a member of the family that owned Melvinia okay yeah okay so you have been writing your um, column, it's, it's entitled Working Lives. That's, That's right, The Working Life. Uh, for a year. Um, how does writing a column about the working lives of New Yorkers compare to what you did before? You know, in a, in a way, I mean, there are many similarities, but also many differences. The similarities are that I've always been the kind of writer who tries to bring um, the lives of people, um, you know, the stories of people to life. Uh, wherever I've been, whether it's overseas or here. So, so that's similar. Um, but writing a column is, is very different from, you know, the 20 odd years I've spent um, as a reporter. You know, you, you write with a point of view. Um, sometimes the I appears, you know, even though this is not an opinion column, it's a metro column. So really it is more about other people than myself. Um, but bringing my own perspective um, to, um, you know, to something I write is obviously something that I haven't done before. Mm hmm Is it, do you like it? <laughs> I think, you know, <laughs> I do, I do like it. it. I, I do like it. I think initially, you know, initially I, it, 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 and it still is, you know, an adjustment. It's just shy of a year and I, I think I'm still adjusting, but I'm feeling more comfortable mm -hmm. as I go along. You're writing about, and, and work is probably the biggest issue on the minds of Americans right now. Right. Uh, you know, finding it, keeping it, managing to build a life with it, you know, what kind of work one's children is, and what kind of work and future one's children can look forward to. And you write about New Yorkers who engaged in various kinds of work, their satisfactions, their struggles, the issues facing them. Do you see certain themes uh, that keep recurring? One of the things that I really wanted to look at and um, you know, during the course of this year was just the economy and how people are managing. Um, you know, the recession is over, um, the economy is on an upswing-ish, you know, and for a lot, a lot of people, even though there are jobs being created, um, a lot of people are still unemployed, a lot of people are still making less than they did um, before the recession. Um, a lot of people are struggling to find and hold on to jobs um, that have the same kind of supports, you know, with benefits and insurance and, and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of people are trying to carve out new paths for themselves because the idea that 
people might stay with one company that pays well and continues to pay well for 20 or 30 years is really um, not the way it looks like it's going to go for a lot of that people. That left a while ago. Right. <laughs> So people are, you know, uh, are carving out interesting um, uh, niches for themselves, and there's a lot of reinvention going mm -hmm. on. In one recent column, you compared the working life of a unionized retail worker, she works at Macy's, to that of a non-unionized retail worker, and the results were not surprising. You know, people who are, are protected by unions tend to do a lot better, um, and only 24 percent of New York City workers belong to unions now, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is actually more than twice the national average. Right. But only 24 percent, which means 70, 76 percent are not. What does that say to you about the state of labor in New York City? Well, you make a good point, uh, which is that, you know, New York City is uh, labor is stronger here than in far uh, many other places. Um, but the reality is that most New Yorkers, like most Americans, are making their way without uh, union support, without union protections. And so there are lots of other organizations that are coming up to kind of support workers that are not kind of traditional uh, unions. But, um, you know, people are um, making do and finding ways without it. There's no other choice, really. You write about some, in your columns, you write, you show some of the other ways that the post-recession uh, has affected um, uh, New York workers. Uh, for instance, well, I guess this is, this is a, in the metro area, about the New Jersey woman who was, who's, was working three shifts at Dunkin' Donuts in order to, to make do and died while sleeping in her car between shifts, uh, and about the fact that fewer teenagers have jobs because of part-time and seasonal jobs. They used used to get while they were in high school are, have, are being taken by, they're competing with adults. Right, right. So there are a lot of um, lingering effects, as you said, as you pointed out in the uh, uh, earlier. Um, in your reporting on the city's workers, have there been any real eye openers for you? You know, I mean, some of the things that are interesting, it's interesting looking at young people, I think, um, particularly at a time when, um, you know, people are, uh, cobbling together stuff and, and how they look at things and where they are finding opportunities. Um, so two columns um, stand out in that regard. One was about um, a guy who, uh, in his early 30s, who lost um, a job, stable job with benefits, who decided to kind of uh, go it with, uh, you know, a freelance kind of life. He created kind of a small, single person software uh, website development company um, had a dramatic decrease in income, um, but you know was kind of moving himself along. Another one I did was about uh, a young woman who um, decided to learn to code, and she was someone who was a humanities person who had done you know kind of um, documentary filmmaking assistant kind of jobs, retail and. Um, landed um, a fellowship doing learning coding mm -hmm. and and found I mean actually a significant you could make jump a lot up, of money in coding I've heard a significant jump up in mm -hmm. income and um, and for um, New York with Silicon Alley and um, you know I think young people and not only young people are, are, are seeing that as a as rich with possibility mm hmm we're gonna take a short break then we'll be back with more with the Working Life columnist, Rachel Swarns. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with New York Times, the Working Life columnist, Rachel Swarns. You wrote one column about a pregnant woman who was fired from her job because on her doctor's orders, she could no longer work overtime. Uh, I mean, who knew about the Pregnancy Workers Fairness Act? That's a federal law? It's actually, a, it's, a, it's a New York City. It's a New York City law. New York City law. Okay. Did she or her lawyer approach you? Is that how you found about the so I She is the second case that I've written about this year. This, this law passed a, a year ago in October and took effect in January of 2014. 
And um, in January, there was uh, another uh, worker who, um, you know, could no longer lift. She worked in a um, in a thrift shop uh, where there's a lot of carrying of clothes back and right. forth from storerooms and stuff, and she could no longer do that. And she was forced out of her job. She was represented by a group called A Better Balance um, and a, a nonprofit group uh, that works on these issues. And so I've just been following up. Um, there has been um, more dissemination of information. Um, the city is trying to get the word out. Some of the advocacy groups are trying to get the word out. That you can't do certain things just because women are pregnant. That's to, right. To and yeah. you know, I think it's one of these issues where um, professional women take it almost for granted that, you know, there we can telecommute, um, you know, there are all kinds of things. You could you could be on bed rest and still right. be working. Right. I think it's um, you know, for women though who are in low wage um, jobs, it's much harder and um, making sure that uh, women know and that employers know mm -hmm. uh, what the obligations are. And that they are, obey the law. And that they obey the right. law. Um, and one, one of your pieces you wrote about uh, a subject that I hadn't thought about for a long time, hadn't been written about for a long time, and that's workfare. Uh, Mayor de, Bl de Blasio's plan to overhaul workfare, which is the program under which people who are collecting what we used to call welfare uh, must work for some kind of city, in some kind of city job in return for getting their welfare check. Uh, and the complaint, you know, has been that the current program doesn't do enough to move these workers into real full-time jobs. Um, and supposedly, uh, de Blasio's new program is going to put more emphasis on education and training than just on working a city job. Um, but as you pointed out, you know, education and job training programs have not worked terribly well for a lot right, of workers. There's a long history you know, here. Right. You know, people who, who, you know, the steel mills close, auto plants close, That's we're right. going to retrain you, and they get, you know, and right. no, no jobs appear. Um, so, I mean, this is going to be a tough slog. I mean, especially since you're, you're dealing with people, I mean, even if you're able to get them uh, the high school equivalency uh, through some training program, just looking the, at the job situation as a result of the previous recession, not so many self-sustaining jobs, even especially for those at the low end. That's, that's going to be that's right. And so know. it's 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 very interesting because it really is a change in um, emphasis. It's it's really rethinking how we do uh, this work of finding real jobs for people. And, um, you know, the jury is still out, I mean, right. on how well it will work. Um, but it's a big shift. You know, people may remember that Mayor Giuliani had in the 90s, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, the largest workfare program in the nation. How many and, run it now? Um, now there are about 8,000, 9,000. Yeah. Um, on used it. to be more than 20,000, yes, right? Yes, it used to be close to 38,000. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a big change. But there's no doubt, and I think the de Blasio administration is not under any illusions either. This is not easy work, right. um, and it will be very interesting to see how it goes. Um, what do you see as the most pressing issues facing New York workers these days? I think it's, you know, again, the issue that are, is facing many Americans is just um, not falling backward. I think people are really, um, if you look at the latest census data that came out um, earlier this year, um, looking at income, people are making less than they did. Um, and I think people are very concerned about maintaining um, a reasonable standard of, li of living. Um, people are really concerned about their children and the future. Um, I think um, we're in a period that is even even as you know, again, the recession is over, the economy is growing. There's enormous uncertainty and anxiety, um, and I think we saw that in the exit uh, polls from the last uh, this recent election. People feel very uncertain mm -hmm. and concerned about where we are and what's next. And it's interesting that while the one percent, you know, their income just keeps going up, you know, by leaps and bounds, you have all of these people who. Um, uh, their income has been stagnant That's for right. years. 
uh, and in some cases they're just happy to have a job, you That's know, right. but their income has not been, been, been catching up with the increase in food prices at Fairways and That's right. Fairway and, and, and every place else in the city. Right, and I think people are very aware of the gap, you know, um, and of income inequality and, um, you know, how we as a city um, and as a country deal with that mm -hmm. is interesting. You know, the de Blasio administration wants to tackle it, you know, head on, and that's, he ran on that, um, right. Mayor de Blasio. And it, again, it'll be interesting to see kind of what can be done. Right. There was an article in, in today's Daily News about uh, somebody had done a study about the decline in black middle class New Yorkers, you know, the people who have moved out of the city because they right. can't afford, you know, the cost, gone back down south or That's wherever. Right. That's right. Very interesting. I, I teach a course in persuasive writing at Queens College, and um, one of the exercise, one of the assignments is to write a metro column. And I tell them that a metro column is sort of like a news story with benefits. <laughs> that um, it, it, it's a, a story that contains facts, color characters, but it also has a point of view. Uh, it, depending on the columnist, often makes an argument. Your columns don't take positions. I mean, you don't, as the writer, don't make arguments. You just tell the stories and let the readers draw their own conclusions. It seemed to me from your columns that I You know, it's a wrote. mix. I'd say most of the columns are about um, the lives of New Yorkers. Um, but on certain policy issues, for instance, on, on the living wage, um, on paid sick leave, I've actually done the more traditional. Um, so on, on, on city policy dealing with um, how do we bridge this divide? How do we kind of raise the floor uh, for working people? Um, you know, I have weighed in. And you know, as, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a new columnist, so I'm kind of putting my toes in the water there. But mostly what Finding I really balance, feel yeah. um, like I want to do um, is uh, to bring um, the stories of how New Yorkers are uh, living, working, coping, struggling, um, you know, rising, um, and make it real. Um, and I think um, I think that's important. Have you found any personal heroes among the workers that you've written about? Oh wow, that's a tough one. I mean, there are lots of them. I mean, you know. One of my favorite columns actually was about um, a zookeeper, um, a guy at the Bronx Zoo um, who has been there for many years and who knew, but the zookeepers uh, in New York are unionized. <laughs> so it's actually well, good. good. For <laughs> <laughs> it's good work. Otherwise the animals could be in trouble. <laughs> uh, but, um, but you know, I, 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 what I've really enjoyed is, um, or, or the woman who, um, you know, uh, makes cotton candy out in Coney Island, um, a column about summer in the city. I, I, I've really enjoyed, it's hard to pick and choose, I've really enjoyed kind of having the opportunity to step into people's lives mm -hmm. for a bit. Do you see anything happening on any level, governmental, institutional, personal, that makes you optimistic about the future of New York workers? I think I would say, you know, I am, watching with great interest. I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that um, the mayor is, um, is serious about doing what he can um, to improve um, the lives of, of working people in the city, uh, but mayors can only do so much. Um, we know from this last election, for instance, that uh, the path uh, for New York City to get the power to raise its own minimum wage is going to be far more difficult than he had hoped. Um, so I think that, and, and a lot of this is to tie to policies in Washington as well. So you've got the state, you've got Washington to deal with. It's, it's not easy. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. Um, so I am hopeful. But I think we have to wait and see. And New Yorkers certainly have a lot of energy, a lot of pluck, you yep. know, in the face of it all. That's absolutely right. You were born. You were born and grew up in New York City. That's right. I was born in Queens and grew up in Staten Island. Okay. What attracted you to journalism? You know, I always wanted to write. I wanted to, you know, write that uh, great American novel. Ah, and realized, you too. yes, like everybody, <laughs> realized that perhaps um, I, I needed some more uh, more pressing deadlines. Um, and in high school, uh, 
decided that perhaps journalism was something where I could channel my um, desire to did write. Did you work for the high school newspaper? High school you newspaper? know, I, I went to Stuyvesant High School and what I did was I, I took a semester and did an internship um, at a publication called New Youth Connections then. That's a great which publication. Which was a, it's so great. a wonderful, wonderful experience. Are they still experience. in operation? Yes, Youth Communications is still. They are so still yeah. great. And that really was my first real hands-on experience about uh, writing about life in the city. Okay, so what's your next column is about? Give us a little. So the column today is about kind of what the changes in health insurance have been like for people. I focus on an actor um, who got his insurance through the health fund for actors equity, the actors union. And that health fund, like many uh, other private employers, you know, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, have decided that they're no longer covering um, right. segments. Right, go to the health, go to go the health to exchange. The, that's ex right. exactly right. right. And, and, and just what that shift is like for people, right. not easy. Yeah. Well, uh, we will watch with interest. As you watch with interest what's happen, what happens to the workers of New York, we will watch with interest what you write about. Thank you. We're out of time. My thanks to Rachel Swarns for joining us. You can read the Working Life column each Monday in The Times, as well as online at nytimes.com. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.